want to begin by describing what a covenant is. Those of you who were here in November when I talked about sharing of our time, talent, and treasures will remember that a covenant is a sacred promise that we make to one another. And from the moment we are born, we are born into covenant. A covenant is that sacred promise our parents or guardian made to take care of us and to nurture us into being. And not only were they responsible for giving life to us, but they were responsible for continuing to be our caretakers and our caregivers. And so a covenant is usually marked in different ways by different religious traditions through different rituals. In the Jewish tradition, if you happen to be a male child, there would be this act called a bris, right? And it's a circumcision moment, but not only is that a physical act, it's also an act of dedication for that child's life to God. Because in the Jewish tradition, there's a high emphasis on this word covenant as seen in that movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Cue the theme song for Indiana Jones, right? So, thank you, Rob. That wasn't even planned, but I, I appreciate that. So, there's this whole idea of a covenant as being that promise that God will take care of the Hebrew people as well as the Hebrew people taking care of one another. So, it's both a horizontal and a vertical relationship. In the Christian tradition, there's a christening that marks the beginning and the dedication of a baby's life. And even within Unitarian Universalism, we have child dedication services that mark that occasion. So a covenant is a promise to be responsible for each other's well-being. It's like that song that was just sung, I won't give up on us that no matter what happens through thick and thin, you can count on me. And that we are our siblings keeper, right? That we belong to one another. That's what a covenant states. So some of you may be wondering, what's the difference between a covenant and a contract? Aren't these all agreements that we make with one another? Well, a contract, on the other hand, is a legal document that, if broken, you could actually take someone to court with that, right? And sue them for breaking their covenant, for breaking their contract. I'm glad you were paying attention in terms of the difference between the two. A covenant, on the other hand, what happens if you break a covenant? because many congregations, including ours, have a covenant of right relationship, for example, which is a behavioral covenant stating that this is the promise that we make to each other in terms of how we're supposed to act and relate to one another. And this is our way of stating that certain behavior is acceptable and certain ones aren't. If you break that covenant, you won't necessarily be taken to court, but rather you will be encouraged to come back into covenant and become part of the circle again. And that usually requires some kind of restorative process. So be it um, a conversation one-on-one -on -one, or perhaps a facilitated conversation and a conflict transformation kind of moment is what brings us back into covenant. Now, what a good example is of having both elements present is a marriage. Because as we all know, marriage is more than just a piece of paper, although it is that as well, right? A, a marriage is a contractual agreement between two people 
to share their resources together and share their finances together, and in some cases, even to share in the caretaking of the children that the people who have entered into this marriage comes to an agreement on. And there's a covenantal aspect of the marriage of we are going to trust one another, and if we make a promise to take care of each other in such a way that that is part of the covenant we make with one another. Now, you may be asking, what's that got to do with being part of Fourth Universalists? Well, a member of this congregation has both a covenantal and a contractual obligation to this congregation. So the fiduciary responsibility lies in this body called the board. And the board knows all too well about the contracts that it signs with other contractors, for example, to take care of the building and whatnot. And the covenantal aspect, as I mentioned before, is your sacred vow and promise to take care of one another. Now, the bylaws, which is a legal document, states that in order to be a member of this congregation, you need to both A, sign the book, right? And B, have a pledge on record, which means that you are agreeing to give a certain amount to the congregation in terms of financial obligations to sustain the work of this congregation. And that's when the second word comes into play, this word stewardship. What does it mean to be a financial steward of this congregation? Because today is Stewardship Sunday. And what it means for me to be a steward is knowing what to do with what you have been born with. Whether you are born with a silver spoon or wooden chopsticks, each of us have been born with a certain amount of resources. And stewardship is knowing what to do with the resources that you've accumulated throughout your life. So stewardship is that ability to discern and make a decision on what you want to do with the resources you have been blessed with. And for many in this congregation, that comes in the form of a pledge. Again, a pledge is something that you promise to give the congregation a particular congregational year in order to sustain the work of this congregation. Now, some of you may be wondering, is the is a pledge similar to tithing? Because when I was growing up, I heard about this word tithing, right? And, and I agree with you. I grew up in such an environment where I was taught what it meant to tithe 10%, for example, of your income. And for those of you who grew up Mormon may have remembered that sometimes that 10% is automatically deducted from your salary right? So the bishops and of the stake or the higher ups actually kind of know what you're making. If you lived in Utah, for example, this is a very common practice for employers to deduct 10% and give it to the LDS church right away, right? So, um, uh, so there's this whole idea of pledging. And as Unitarian Universalists, we may not necessarily talk about pledge or t pledging in the same way as we do tithing. But as my email indicated, there is a recommendation from the Unitarian Universalist Association to think about what it would mean if we just considered giving 5%, for example, towards the work of the congregation. Now, I know that for some of you, that could even seem kind of overwhelming because that seems like such a big amount. But let's think about that for a second. What would that mean towards the kind and level of programming that we're able to do in this congregation? And what does it mean, on the other hand, to not give anything towards the work of this congregation? So what would it mean if 
we pledge zero dollars, for example, um, in order to sustain this congregation. That was not, by the way, the reason why we do not have heating for those of you sitting in the sanctuary today, right? Um, but that could be, if we didn't have any money for heating, um, we wouldn't be able to afford the 40,000 or so that we spend on oil each year to heat up the sanctuary, right? Um, so there, there could be that kind of thinking, but the bigger question I have is what is worth more to you than zero dollars in order to sustain this congregation? Is spending money on a one-way subway ride, which is $2.90, so what you give to the MTA, for example, is that worth more than what you give to Fourth U and what you get out of being a member here? And who covers that money anyway whenever someone gives zero dollars to this congregation. Look around you, it's other members of this congregation who are living into the covenant that are covering that amount of money, right? And again, what does it mean when we spend more on a cup of coffee or other luxuries in life, quote, quote unquote, than we do to this congregation? So that's my challenge is to try to find a number between zero and five to 10% as a way to gauge how much to give to this congregation. Otherwise, I'm not gonna tell you how much to give because I don't know what your situation is, I don't know what your income is, and I don't know what your relationship with money is. Because at the end of the day, the amount doesn't really matter. According to Lynn Twist, abundance is not an amount, it's a state of being. So what I wanna encourage us more is to live into this flow and live into this state of abundance. So I wanna give you some facts and figures today. So we have 137 members of this congregation. And out of those members, we have 100 pledging units, right? And I must say that compared to other congregations, there are more givers on the lower percentage of the quartiles levels. So meaning that there's only two people, two pledging units, I should say, that pledge on the top quartile level. So, and very few in that middle part, and a lot on the lower part, meaning that if only one of those pledging units were to stop pledging or were to lower their pledge significantly, it would take 30 more pledging units to make up for that. Does that make sense? Even for those of you who are mathematically challenged, maybe, perhaps, right? That it would take a lot of people to sustain that level of giving. So some of you may not know this, but do you know a person named Louise Carnegie, the wife of Andrew Carnegie? She used to be a member of this congregation way back when. And in fact, here's a piece of trivia for you. She was the one that contributed our organ to us way back when, right? But as you may have noticed, that organ is no longer functioning. And it would take hundreds and thousands of dollars to fix that organ. I think Rob has done the research on that, right? And so clearly these one-time levels of giving and just one or two givers is not going to sus continually sustain the work and the programming and the life of this congregation. It takes all of us through our crowdfunding to be able to sustain um, the work of this congregation. And here's the reality. Our ancestors believed in Fourth Universalist enough to invest in it. It is our responsibility and our covenant to future generations to say that we too believe in them and we believe in the life-saving message that is offered here at Fourth Universalist to become good stewards, not just for today, but for the future as well. And I just want to use another analogy. I know 
you know, it's not really glamorous to talk about where your giving goes or where your pledge goes when it comes to just building maintenance or keeping the lights on. But what if we were to view giving as sim something similar to the flow of electricity, right? So last week, those of you who were here for our service may have noticed that at the end we sang this little light of mine. Remember that? And I got an email from someone who had only been attending two or three times who said that I am so glad I found this congregation because I was rejected by my former congregation. And here at Fourth U, I felt like I was at home. And your message about living in liminal spaces really resonated with me because that's where I feel like I'm at at this point. And it's so hard to wake up in the morning and even find hope and find light in my life at this point. But singing that song had new meaning for me because I used to sing it in Sunday school all the time, didn't really know what it meant until I sang it today, which was last week, and I focus on the word little light, that even just having that tiny little light flicker inside of me is what gave me hope to live another day and to come back to life again and to be part of a religious community again and to trust again that there are going to be others who are going to be looking out for my best interests. So yeah, it is about keeping the lights on. It is about letting that flow of electricity and that current increase just a little bit more so that like that dimmer switch, there could be a little bit more light in the world. So again, while I may not be asking you to give a certain amount or a certain percentage even of your income, I am asking you today to consider what would it mean to flick the dimmer switch just a little bit further on that light of yours so that it's not so little and that it'll shine for the whole world to see. I just, um, I'm thinking about how covenant leads us from birth to death and that even legacy giving, people at the end of their lives when they're thinking about who to bequeath their estate to or um, and, and what kind of um, and trust and will to give um, in the future, it made me think about how some people, for example, have chosen to give a living legacy now, meaning that they want to see the fruit of their labor in action now. And it's kind of like those celebration of life services where you gather together your friends before you die so that you could actually hear the nice things they have to say about you, right? Um, instead of waiting until you're gone when all your other friends and relatives are the only ones who get to hear how fabulous you are. So what would it mean to have an opportunity to live that out now and to invest in this congregation now? What would it mean to be a steward of our covenant from birth to death? So I just want to encourage you to think about how you're going to let it flow. How are you going to let the abundance flow through you so that it would end up blessing the world? Not to quote or anything from another musical or Disney movie, actually, Frozen, but, you know, instead of let it go, let it flow, let it flow, right? Why don't we let that be our mantra today? Hi, and welcome to Getting the Message, where we dive a little bit deeper in today's service themes. Today is a fun one, Reverend Jonifer. It is, it is. the treasure, uh, <laughs> the treasure sermon. It's talking about... Or the Sermon on the Mount, as some may call it. <laughs> but I'm fun. We're going to see how many puns we can fit in today. <laughs> um, I'm going to keep making notes for later for that one for myself. Um, but yeah, so this is, you know, kind of a, um, a loaded topic for maybe a congregation or for places of people who are recovering from communities that had much stricter understandings of, of giving money at, at a congregation. You and mm -hmm. I were actually sharing a little bit about our own childhood experiences of, of giving money at church. 
we were because we live in a society where talking about money could be a huge baggage sometimes because we hear so many mixed messages from society and even perhaps our family and our parents. Is it not enough having, having not enough money growing up or having uh, feeling guilty for perhaps having too much money on the other end of that spectrum? Wouldn't that have been nice though, growing up uh, with that problem, right? Um, but I remember for me, even when I was a young kid, um, it was already hammered into me growing up in a fundamentalist evangelical background, like I'm, I know you did as well, Ember, um, that tithing means giving 10% of whatever income you make. And the way that my parents modeled it for us, modeled in, modeled in quotes, is that they would actually give us the money so that when the plate comes around, uh, we would have something to put in the plate. Because at the time, of course, we weren't uh, making money on our own other than perhaps... You didn't have um, to tie your allowance? No, I didn't I didn't have to do that. So that was... I was encouraged uh, to do so, but I never was forced Did to. you actually do it? Uh, like every once in a while, I'd give like a few dollars, like once a year, or like gotcha. from my allowance savings. Um, yeah, and I think that's the difference between back then and now, you know, is that there was pressure, there was shame around it, there was guilt around not giving, um, and that there was a, a, a much higher sense of expectation. Right. Yeah. You know, I always, uh, I would ask my mom that I could be the one to put in the envelope in because we had like, you know, the special giving envelopes and I made mm. sure to be the one to put it in. And we, uh, that's actually about when people gave in cash, right? right? For yeah, my part. mom would write checks sometimes. She oh, was very right. big on the check. Cash or checks, right. That's where I learned to write a budget. So thanks mom. <laughs> that's actually a very useful skill I learned. Um, yeah, but, these days it's so easy with auto pay, and you even get miles and points for it if you. That, that's put what in we your need. Card, we need miles right? and points for what you can <laughs> um, get at Fourth U. You get a free trip from your pledge. <laughs> my um, my favorite story around my childhood giving and tithing was that as someone who by late high school knew that I wanted to go into ministry, I remember talking uh, with the minister, uh, and you see, growing up in a military family. My uh, dad, um, you know, in the military, you don't get taxed on the income because, like, it's from the government. Like, so you don't, like, re-get taxed on the money that they're giving you. So that was, like, my logic was the same for ministry, was since I'm getting money from the church, being in ministry means I'm exempt from tithing. And the minister was like, no, 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 no. Like, it is our honor to give our money. And I'm like, but ministers barely make any money. <laughs> I'm not getting into this field for the money. Um, but, that, you know, that's always my favorite is that I was looking for the out. Um, how to get around giving um, by going into ministry. So you can tell that my intentions as a young teenager ember uh, were very, very wholesome towards ministry. <laughs> But speaking of taxes, I, I preach a sermon once, so I'd give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and give unto God what is God's. So we, you know, probably heard that passage before, right? And um, these days it feels like we give a lot in taxes, especially here living in New York. Of You have the borough tax and the state tax and so on and so forth. And that for many people amounts to 33%, unless you were um, a certain rich CEO or something, <laughs> in which case you pay nothing in taxes. But the question is, I want to see where um, my giving goes towards something good. So in the case of taxes, it goes towards building roads and the public libraries and all those other tangible things that we, um, you know, our tax dollars at work, so to speak. In a congregation, sometimes that is not as easily seen. Of, right. How are your pledges um, working towards advancing the common good? But here at Fourth View, I hope we could see that the programming we have, like this getting the message portion, of, for example, would not be possible without your pledge at work, right? And there are so many other ways in which we are able to grow our spiritual lives because of the giving that takes place here. What I love, one of the things that you mentioned in the in the service, which is like this idea that, you know, our ancestors invested in us. And like, Indeed. you know, we see that on yes. personal scales, but like, I think about this big old building right here. Like, yeah, they believe that this community was so important that they yeah. wanted this very, very like statement <laughs> building um, 
to like stand out and to say that we are committed to being here and we're committed to being in this specific space. Um, you know, the Upper West Side has changed a lot during the time that this building has stood. Indeed. Yes. And it's been around since 1838. We hope it will still be here in 2038 and, and pro possibly beyond, right? 2938. 20 <laughs> That's a long time for it. <laughs> I can't even think that far. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. I'm <laughs> going to upload my consciousness into the AI and I'll be, uh, be uh, there we in go. 2938 AI religious education courses. And fourth, you will be here forever. Yes, there we go. In the AI world. But yeah, I think it's really important that this idea of, um, you know, maybe we need to do like the government and we need to um, buy the big signs that say, hey, this is your tax dollars at work. <laughs> also, the tax dollars paid for the sign to say that it's your tax dollars at work. But, you know, That's we right. can say like, you know, in last year we had lots of like construction stuff still up as they were finishing the lighting projects. So we could see some of our, our pledges at work of working on maintaining this building, making sure that like all of our systems are working. But yeah, you know, like... Although, if you, you know, were paying attention earlier, we did make a dif distinction between what goes towards the annual pledge and capital campaign. Right. So most of the building work did come from the capital campaign, which was a special um, program to raise funds for re-roofing and for the awesome sound system that we have now and the technology that we've invested in so that um, especially during the pandemic and now these days with a multi-platform kind of worship experience that we are able to connect with people from all over the world people like you who are joining us from Mexico and California and Ireland and other parts of the world so we are going global because um, Again, we're investing in the future. Yeah. There's this whole idea, right, that we're not going to look back to the past, but rather um, to see how we could continue this message, this radical message of inclusion for future generations. Uh, Reverend Jonathan, for, thanks for sitting down and for tackling a tough top topic today. Well, thank you for the great questions, Amber, and for also sharing from your childhood and experiences with money. And thanks as always to all of our listeners tuning in from the YouTube land.